come now in the name of Jesus asking that you would heal, deliver and set free Father I pray now that you would save souls strengthen the weak give guidance to the blind unstop deaf ears Father I pray now in the name of Jesus that your will will be done Preach to us now, Lord. Teach us of your holy word. And Father, I pray now that lives will be made better, be made stronger. I pray, Father, that prayers will be answered. I pray, Father, that lives will be changed. Relationships will be made better. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that all glory and honor be to you. I pray, Father, that man will learn that every good and every perfect gift comes from you, but also that they know and understand that every good and every perfect gift is free because of you. Father, would you watch over those that are traveling? Watch over those that are not here today to worship you. Teach them, O oh God, to worship you wherever they are. And Father, again, I say thank you. Thank you most of all for your son Jesus, who made preparations for us by dying on Calvary's cross. Thank you, Lord, for one that would love us so much that he would come down from royalty and walk amongst men and show us a more excellent way. Thank you, Lord, for holding our hands when we were in fear and doubt. Thank you, Lord, for protecting us while we were in the very image of death. Father, we love you and we pray all glory and honor to you both now and forever. And it's in your son Jesus' name that I pray. And all of God's children said together, Amen. 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 We will be looking in the book of Matthew today, chapter 25. It's a lengthy reading today. We'll be reading verses, starting at verses 31 through 46. Maybe the bulk of the preaching today will be in the reading of God's word today. Matthew 
chapter 25, starting at verses, verse 31 and concluding at 46. And it reads, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we, ye, saw we thee hungry? And fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty. And you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, or athirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison? and did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. I want to ask a question today. Which side will you be on? Which side will you be on? When the Lord returns and begins to separate the wheat from the tear at his return and his separation of the sheep from the goats at his return when he separates the righteous from the unrighteous, which side will you be on? When it comes to separation, it's really not that the Lord will be separating you. It's that you have separated yourself. And you separated yourself because he gave instructions before he came. He gave opportunity before he returns. Because what you will be dealing with at his return will be based on how you receive the word of God Amen. before he gets here. Amen. This is, will not be a surprise to any of us at his return. At his return, you will know what instructions God has already left for you. And I believe it because what he has asked us to do 
is so simple that a child can understand, and a fool has no need to error. He has not left you with anything to do that he has not already created you to do and given you the ability to accomplish it. I know some people may disagree with me, but this is what I consider to be the gospel truth. You don't even have to step in a church house to hear the word of God. You don't have to go to church Sunday after Sunday to hear the word of God. I believe that before any man leaves this earth, the gospel will come to you. Now, whether you accept it or not, that's on you. But God is not going to judge you for that which you don't know. But he will deal with you for that which you do know but don't do. And here we're going to see it, the very simple or the simplicity of the word of God. God has created us for a reason and given us a responsibility and a purpose that anybody can fulfill. And it's only dealt based on your faith and your belief in the word of God who has created you in his likeness and in his image. This text by some writers have suggested that the uh, book of Matthew here is talking about the Gentile nation. I was not there when they concluded their findings, but I believe that these principles are not just for the Gentile nations. This is for the Jew, the bond, the free, the Greek, the Gentile, this is for all those who profess to be a child of the king. Because at his return, he's going to deal with the bond, the free, the Jew, and the Gentile. And here we see that God has mandated that all of his children be not just hearers, but also doers of his word. As we walk through the text, we see that the Lord at his return has said, now I'm going to place you either on the right hand or the left hand. You're going to be on the right side or the wrong side. But it's based on your belief and your daily walk with your brethren. Because the text teaches us that he said that when I came and was hungry, those of you that I'm putting on my right hand or my right side, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you comforted me. This is what God has chosen for all of us to do for one another. And then the righteous, the Bible says, I believe in verse number 37, they turned and said, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked? When did we see you in prison? When did we see you sick? That was very interesting to, for me, for the righteous to ask the question, when did we see you like that? Because I see sometimes that we as the righteous, God's children, the chosen people of God, Sometimes we have the idea that we, we, we rec we're going to do this for God. And we're going to do these things to prove to God who we are and show him who we are. But that's a dangerous state of being to be in. Because usually when you have that frame of mind, you only feed those who you want to feed. You only clothe those who you want to clothe. You only visit those who you want to visit. See, I, I'm now I'm teaching and trying to get the church to visit the sick and visit one another. And I believe first things first, and, and, and I believe things grow in stages. And I want to commend Third Avenue now that now that we have those that are in their senior moments and those who are sick, now I'm encouraging all of the believers to go and visit with them and sit with them, 
But I must tell you now, because I believe it's the Holy Spirit leading. Now, that's just the first stage. Now we can move to the second stage. And that second stage is not to visit just you and your folks. But we've got to learn how, when we go to the hospital, to visit our folks. We've got to lend an ear to the stranger and to our neighbors. Ain't nothing wrong with peeping in another room and letting them know that God loves them just as much as they love the person that you're visiting. And that's why they ask this question, who? Who was it? When did we see you hungry and naked? Can I open your mind a little bit? When you are really a righteous child of God, when you do the work of God, then it escapes you why you even doing it. <laughs> Let me break this down to you. When you're truly a child of God, you don't pick and go try to find the hungry to feed. You just feed folks that's around you. You don't try to go and find somebody that needs clothing. They'll come to you, and you'll just be there to be an example for them. That's the daily walk of a believer. I shared it with you once before, but maybe I should say it again. Somebody is just a cup of coffee away from accepting your God. Somebody is just a, how you doing? Do you know Jesus? Away from committing suicide. If somebody just needs somebody to walk by and encourage them and let them know that everything is going to be all right because I know a man who was able to handle all of your situations. When you are a child of God, you ain't got to tell nobody you're a child of God. Amen. And you don't have to look for somebody that you desire to help. Because everybody in this world needs help. Well, let me bag it up and say it like this. Maybe it might not be your lot to feed somebody. Maybe you need somebody to come by and feed you. But if you're a born-again child of God, you'll let him order your steps. And he'll take that turkey dinner to that person that needs a meal on today. That's why I really have a problem with feeding folks on Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then you got 10 other months that you don't feel like the Lord is leading you to help nobody. You ought to be able to feed anytime and at all times. The Bible tells us to rejoice always. And I told you rejoicing is really working. It ain't just hollering. It's about helping. But here they ask the question, when did we see you? And can I tell you what I, else I see here in the text? They're saying that we did what you asked us to do, and we were not looking for you. We just did it because of you. Amen. That's a strong walk for the believer. I'm not trying to prove nothing to God because he already knows all about me. He already knows who I am. I do what I do for the Lord, and I'm growing. I'm getting there. I do it because, for the Lord because he is God. I already know that he's my God. But some things you do just because he is God. And because he is God, I have to honor his word. And we need to walk like him and talk like him and just do the things that he says do. Not that we're trying to get his eye. But because his eye is already on us. We're not trying to buy our way into heaven. We do these things because we're already on our way to heaven. And, and, and I believe a lot of the Christian people suffer today because they're trying to spend so much time trying to prove something to God. And you can't prove nothing to somebody who already knows. If you just go on and do what he asks you to do. Can you see the benefits of just being obedient Amen. and just being a child of God? Amen. Here the text tells us that they fed them when they was hungry, yeah. clothed them when they was naked, visited them when they were sick, came and sat with them when they were in prison. And again, we see in the text that once we learn to do these things, it doesn't make God bigger. It makes you better. Look what they are doing. They're feeding those that are hungry, clothing those that are naked. 
visiting those who are in prison. Don't you see that they don't, that the que no question is asked that we often ask ourselves? We are always ask this question, who is it that we're supposed to go visit when they're in prison? And you know how we are, and I'm going to pick on you a little bit. I, if you're guilty, I ain't coming. If you're wrong, you, got, you do the crime, you got to pay the time. But that ain't what the text said. The text said, when I was in prison, you visited me. Didn't ask, were you guilty? Didn't ask, were you wrong? Didn't ask, why you there, how much time you got. When I was in prison, you visited me. Can I, can I tell you something? When you stop at trying to judge somebody, you can help somebody. It makes no difference why they are there. You want to help them while they are there. Because there's nothing you can do Amen. on your own merit. Amen. And you just don't know the reason or the condition or the state of mind this individual is in Amen. when you're visiting there. Well, let me tell you something else you may not understand. Don't you know that the Lord can save those that are behind prison walls? Don't you know that the Lord can save those that are in prison with what we call an ignorant mind? Don't you know the Lord can save that person who's in a condition that you could very easily have been in yourself? Again, let me change shoes with you. You may not be the one that needs to go visit those that are incarcerated. Maybe you're the one that's already incarcerated. And wouldn't you like somebody to come visit you? with a word from the Lord and not be so critical and so judgmental? Well, I'm just trying to get you to make the decision of what side will you be on when the Lord returns? Will you be a right winger or will you be a left, uh, uh, a left winger? Will you be the one that's on the left hand? Will you be a goat? Because the text here also says that to the same individuals, same group of individuals before the separation takes place. He says, but when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was incarcerated, you didn't visit me. And then they turned and made this statement. Lord, when? When were you ever naked? And when were you ever hungry? And we didn't feed you. And we didn't clothe you. Can I tell you something I see in the text that a lot of people will never see in the text? There are some that have said that the only way they'll ever help God is when I can see him for myself. And the only work I'll ever do for God is what I think I'm doing for him personally. That's why they ask the question, when did we see you naked? And when did we see you hungry? See, there's two groups of people here. One are righteous and the other are self-righteous. Some people say the only thing I'll ever do in the name of Jesus is what I think I'm doing for Jesus. But let me tell you something. There ain't nothing you can do for Jesus because Jesus has already got his stuff together. And that's why they say, now, when you was hungry, Lord, you know we would have fed you. Lord, if you were naked, you know we clothe you. Well, let me tell you how you fed him. Because the Bible says that when he was walking through here, he was the one made the statement, said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So when he was without shelter, I see what kind of shelter you're given. You'll put him in a, in a, in a, in a uh, hotel, not in a hotel room, but you'll put him in the stable. And he said when he was naked, Lord, you know if you was naked, we would have clothed you. Well, I know how you're clothing because the Bible tells me that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then when he did have something that you want and he was clothed, look what you did to him. Let's go to Calvary, up on Calvary. When you thought he had something worth having, you stripped him of his clothes. And then you cast lots for the things that he had. And, and you even gave him a hat. When he was up on Calvary, you wanted him to look good. This is what the unrighteous has done for God. They say, Lord, you know if you needed it, we had it for you. But I know the hat you gave him because you gave him a crown of thorns and wrapped it around his head. 
And when he was poor and had nothing, you gave him a name, the king of the uh, king of the Jews. And then you even said that we would provide everything for you. But up on Calvary, what did you say to him? If you be the son of God, get down off the cross. And then instead of giving to him, you start begging from him. You said, get down off the cross and save yourself, but don't forget about me. Take me too. So the unrighteous said, oh, Lord, we would have done it for you if you had just shown us who you are. But then the Lord says that to the least of these that you have done this to, didn't do it for, you did it unto me. If you wouldn't feed your brother, you wouldn't feed me. This is a whole lot of Bible in just a few scriptures here. Because the Lord has said, how can you love me who you have not seen and hate your brother who you have seen? And that's why I said, if you won't feed your brother, if you won't put shelter over your brother's hand, then I know you know you won't do anything for me. And then he says to the righteous, because you are able to look past a person's need, I mean fault, you're able to meet that need. I told you this is truly simple preaching. That's why a lot of you are just sitting here looking at me the way you are looking. But can I tell you the reality of the simplicity of the Christian walk today? Learn how to treat your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's all living the gospel is. That's as truly as simple as it can be. Can I show you something else that's not in the text but you can read out from the text? You never see here in this text where God tells you to get, uh, 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 get as much knowledge about him as you can and show how strong you are in the Christian faith. You don't see here in the text where he tells you to memorize all my names. Learn in my Jehovah Jireh, Elohim, Sitkanu, Rapha. Find out what the J really means or if the, my name is really Jesus. Or if you really want to prove that you're a child of God, All right. you'll be able to explain some of the things of life that men are arguing from the beginning of time and on down through the end of time. Where did the J come from and why is he Jesus? Because the original alphabet did not have a J in it. And if you really want to know who God is, you ought to be able to answer that question. Let me go and answer that one for you so you don't spend no more time on it. In the original alphabet, there was a whole lot of letters that were not there. But that's not the first way we communicated. When God created us, he taught us how to communicate one with another. It wasn't, it wasn't no J and wasn't no A either. It was God from the beginning. So if you really want to know where he come from, you ain't got to look at no seven continents on this earth. You can't look at Australia and Africa and all these other seven continents. If you really want to know where he originated, he originated from the beginning. Because the Bible told us in the beginning was the word. And the word was God, and the word was with God. Quit trying to locate him. Quit trying to put a, a race on him. Quit trying to put an ethnicity on him. He's God. And he said, learn how to love one another. But here in the text, you never see him try to say, well, try, try to dissect every part of my word. Try to learn all 66 of the Bibles. And even the other ones that man say are not here anymore. Quit trying to learn it from Genesis to Revelation. Quit trying to memorize it, I would say, from Genesis to Revelation. Because how are you going to be able to learn all that will never be completed by man? Some of you don't understand what I'm saying. The word of God is living and is breathing. And it grows. And it has no end. I am the Alpha and the old maker. I am the beginning and I am the end. I am the fullness of time. I am one who cannot be put in a box, jar, or a book. I am the one who is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, if that be God, and I know that it is, how are you ever going to learn all of him? 
Well, he already told us that his ways are not our ways. His ways are as far from us as the heavens are from the earth. So you can memorize all you want. You can learn as much as you want to learn about God, and you still will never know it all. So why are you spending your time philosophizing and arguing with others about who God is when he says, don't, don't worry about that. Get the bigger picture of the Christian walk. Don't try to impress me and get an A on your test or that you write on a paper, but get an A on your life. He said, learn how. To love one another. What's the greatest teaching? Love ye one another. Love your neighbors. Love your friends. Love your enemies. And if you don't know what love is, it's because he is love. You won't define him either. But he says that you ought to love ye one another. The simplicity of the Christian walk of every born-again believer is to learn how to be nice and kind to one another. I know you want something spectacular, but it is spectacular because for some of us, we think it's impossible. We believe that in order to be a strong Christian, we got to know more than everybody else know. We got to know who wrote every book in the Bible, what time it was written, and what he meant when he said that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, as the four Gospels came from four different perspectives, they, were from, they had four different job occupations. Who cares? All I need to know is all of them got the Gospel straight. And the Gospel of Jesus Christ is throughout all of his word, which says he went up on Calvary. And he hung there, he bled, and he died, and he made preparations for all of us who will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Well, let me throw this in since it's Thanksgiving season. You ain't got to buy it because I ain't trying to sell it. It's free. You don't get nothing else. It's free. Confess with your mouth. That's free. The Lord Jesus, and he showed enough free. And might I throw this in, he sure is good. But he said, if you just confess with your mouth, not you ain't got to make a payment for it. Just confess with your mouth. And then he says, for those who have confessed it with your mouth, those that if you really want to be solid in your belief and know what you believe, he said, now that you've confessed it with your mouth, you've made a, this, a declaration verbally. Now you've got to make it physically. He says, now you've got to do what I have instructed you to do in his word. And if you look through all of God's word, you'll always see that he taught all of his children to treat your neighbor right. Let's look at something. Have you ever considered the benefits of treating your neighbor right? Have you ever thought about what actually will happen if you treat your enemy right? Your neighbor. Not the one you like. But the one you don't want to speak to. Let me keep on going. Your neighbor. The one you sure ain't going to vote for. Your neighbor. The one who has not treated you right. What, what, what do you, have you ever thought about, you say you believe in God, right? Now the Bible says that he has all power of heaven and earth in his hand. The Bible teaches us that ain't nothing can happen to you that God will not allow. The Bible teaches us that if we trust him, he will always take care of us. Why are you scared of your neighbor? How are you going to be scared of your neighbor and then turn around with the same lips and say you bless God? How, how does that work? I love you, God. I trust you, God. I know you're able. I've seen a whole bunch of you crying up here just like me. God's so good to me. He takes care of all of my needs. And then when trouble hit, you take off running, crying, blowing snot, don't know when you're going to come back to church, mad because God has not brought something in your life that you wanted right now. But all he said was wait until the opportune time. And you got mad and you didn't trust him. You ran away from church. You don't want to hear what the preacher has to say. And you sure ain't doing no Bible study. But I trust him. 
I'm asking these questions because it's very simple. If you just learn how to walk the way he wants you to walk, Amen. what's the song say? He'll show up in you. This is what God has asked us to do, to love our neighbor. It's not impossible because I told you he is love. What you're sharing with others is him, not yourself. That's why you should not fear in doing what God has asked you to do because he has told you to love your neighbor as yourself. If you really love yourself, you ought to have the very best for yourself, which is God. And he's telling you, if you get enough in me, then I can work through you and accomplish what I set out for you to accomplish. God is saying, if you just learn, if you make a willing effort to do right, I do the rest. Amen. Have you ever thought about what condition you would be in if you learn how to do good to those that despitefully use you? Well, let me ask this question. When they do wrong against you and you get mad about it and you get frustrated about it, how do you benefit from that condition? Well, let me ask this question. What happens when you get mad? Advil won't help it. A leave ain't going to take care of it. You ain't going to smoke enough weed to forget about it. And you ain't going to smoke enough dope to get over it. When you let anger and rage and frustration set in you, you are the ones that go and look for a stress reliever instead of looking to God, the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen. What's the benefit? I see you going to sleep. I'm going to wait till you wake back up because I'm asking these questions because I want some answers today. Do you know how good and pleasant it is to be able to forgive? Do you know how good and how beneficial it is to your life when you learn how to walk away? Now, I'm not telling anybody, I'm not teaching anybody to let somebody abuse you over and over and over again. You know you can love your neighbor without taking abuse, don't you? I, uh, let me explain that because somebody's saying, well, they treat me so bad, I just ain't going to keep taking this over and over. You know, my children, my children have this tendency, and I love them to death, but they have a habit of asking for things all of the time. And every once in a while, some of them will give me the impression and say something like, Daddy, you don't love me. And I said, well, why don't you say, I, why you say I don't love you, sir? Because, Daddy, if you, if you really loved me, you would give me what I asked for. Well, that's because he's a baby, and they're babies. They don't understand. I've been walking with God for a long time. It does not hurt my feelings when they say that because I know they don't know no better. And this is what I tell them, son, you know I can love you from afar just as I can up close. And sometimes I love you enough not to give you which you think you ought to have, than to act like I love you and give you what you don't need. So what I'm going to do now is hang up this phone. And then when I hang up this phone and you come to your senses, because now you're going to be out there with somebody that don't love you, and after a while it's going to hurt so bad, guess who you're going to call? The one that you love. And every now and then I get that phone call, and they call me and say, Daddy, how you doing? And I say, boy, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I teach them the gospel through the living of the gospel. And it's not to allow them to abuse you, but for you to learn to teach them in a teachable moment. Some people won't learn until they get into questionable situations. We'll let things run out of our mouth. We don't mean them. Sometimes it's because we don't know no better. And you have to learn that about your neighbor. Sometimes they just don't know any better. Sometimes they, they, they don't know any better. And some of them are just flat out mean. But the text says that when they was wrong, I mean when they were in a bad situation, we didn't ask whether they were wrong, were they guilty. It does not matter. Because the benefit is for you who are righteous. If you want to end up on the right side, you got to do it 
whether they are right or whether they are wrong. And the benefit is when he returns, he's going to take you to the kingdom. But there's also another benefit. If you're doing what the Lord asks you to do, it's not going to hurt you in time. You ever ask the question by looking at this text, how can I feed somebody unless I got some food? Y'all please wake up. How am I going to go visit somebody that's incarcerated unless I'm free? That didn't do it either. How am I going to put a roof and shelter over somebody's head if I ain't got the resources to do it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. Remember, this is a tough group here. In order to be a blessing, you have to already have been blessed. Amen. What God asks you to do is for somebody who has not received his blessing yet. It is for you who have already been blessed. That's why I keep telling you, if you got that big bank account, it's not for you to brag about. It's for you to help somebody who does not have a bank account. We've got to learn how to provide for one another. After all, isn't that what we're asking our government to do? Are we asking our government to feed those that are hungry and take care of those that don't have living conditions? Don't you know that if God has blessed you with an, an abundance, that means it's for you to share? He just told you he has a window in heaven that will pour you out blessings more than you're able to receive. If you can't receive it all in these two hands, it just seems likely to me you ought to go find some other hands that needs to get under the window so that when you get an abundance of blessings, then you begin to share it with others. The Bible teaches us that when you do what's right, there's no law against it. When you're kind to one another, ain't nothing nobody can do. it. That was what the, the comedian used to say, I love you, and it ain't nothing you can do about it. And the reason that he could say that, because and nothing you could do about it, is because of his benefit, not just for anybody else. It's because he understood that I'd rather have love in my heart than hate. I heard George Pry say it one time, I'd rather for you to cuss me out than for me to cuss you out. I'd rather for you to cheat me than for me to cheat you because I know that if I learn how to bridle my tongue, if I learn how to control my anger, if I learn how to keep my composure, then I'll start looking like the king of kings. I'll start acting like the lord of lords. You know they beat him and whipped him and mocked him and he never said a mumbling word, but when he went up on Calvary, the only thing I know he said was it is finished. And God lets us know that now I'm rejoicing in all the beating, in all the shame that I'm taking. I'm rejoicing now. I got to get out of here now. Because He was able to rejoice because he fulfilled the will of his father. And not only was he rejoicing because of that, but he also made preparations for you and I. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then he said, while they are his enemy, yet will he die for them. Yet will he die uh, deliver them up to our Father who is in heaven. When you do right in the eyes of God, it's a benefit to everybody. The simplicity of the Christian faith and the Christian walk is just learn how to be nice. Learn how to be good. Learn how to overcome evil with good. Learn how to be in the image and the likeness of God. Learn how to not question why a person in the situation they're in. If you see they need to get out of it, we don't need you to ask me why. I need help to get out of it. We have this life that we're living now that we, we just, we got to question you. You got to fill out an application before I do anything for you. You can't even come to church until you can prove that you're worthy to come into a church that you don't own. If you don't look like me, you don't act like me, you don't dress like me, you can't, you can't come in here. 
knowing. That's how you look before you got here. If there's any changes that need to be made in your life, let God change them. Everybody don't like your taste. Everybody don't like your, your, your logic and your reasoning. Won't you let them come in and hear the gospel? If you want somebody to change, you couldn't change them out there. What makes you think you can change them in here? Let God change them. Let God fix it. And what makes you think you got it all together? I'm picking on you now. What makes you think you got it all together? Don't you know it's some more stuff in your life that needs to be worked on? Mm. That hurt me. But we have to learn. The Christian walk is simple. I didn't expect any shouts, any amens today, but I know you're listening. Go read your Bible. Look at what Jesus did. Go tell me how many fights he picked. Go tell me how many people that he said, get away from me. I never knew you. Go tell me out of all of the multitudes that he pulled together before he started preaching and teaching. Tell me how many of them did he say, no, you, 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 and you, y'all get out of here. I got to talk to somebody else. Y'all ain't ready yet. Separation only took place after the teaching. And then when they left with one group of disciples, you know what the Bible said? He said, the Bible said that after his teaching, many of the disciples turned and walked away and to never return again. And then look what he asked the other disciples. Will you go away also? Will you walk away from me also? I ain't did nothing wrong to you. They just walked away because they rejected me. And he said, will you go away also? And they said, well, how shall we, where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And he's teaching them and showing them that I do have the words for eternal life. Eternal life is not the life that we live when we leave here. Let's get that straight. Eternal means forever. You living right now. Eternal started in the beginning. Eternal life means that it just continues. Don't get that mixed up with temporary, temporal life. Temporal life means it's going to shut off one time. Eternal means that it's forever. He said, thou has the words for eternal life. And look at the words that he taught. And I got to go now. The words that he taught were not uh, given instructions on how to live in heaven. The words that he gave in the gospel taught us how to live on heaven, in heaven and on earth. Learn how to be a good Christian by just simply being a good person. That person that you've been having problems with, put some love on them. Quit railing evil for evil. That person that you don't know, get to know them. Because it just may be the person that God wants you to entertain so you can learn how to help people in their hour of need. You want to fill up the church house or do you want to fill up the kingdom? That's good enough.